Okay, I think we will kick off. Welcome, everybody. I'm Lee Harris. I'm co-founder of Trading Research Group. Um, in our audience today, I see a bunch of uh, familiar names. So we have got um, various members and students from Trading Research Group. Uh, we also have some names which I don't recognize. So if you've come to this as a guest, either from one of our mail outs or social media, this kind of thing, welcome. I'm uh, really glad to have you here today. Today's session is going to be, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour, something like that. Um, depends upon the level of interaction, Q&A, this kind of thing. And we're going to look at some stats around some of the markets that we trade. Now, this is a follow-on session to the free session which I did last week, where we were exploring the idea of, is trading gambling? Question mark. And then in small type underneath that title, we're saying, and if it is, can we exploit that to our advantage? Um, is it gambling? A lot depends on the definition of gambling, really, and how motivated that is for you. Um, can we exploit some of those characteristics to our advantage? Absolutely. Of course we can. Uh, that's where we got to last week. And if you weren't able to make that session live, there is a recording of that on our website at tradingresearchgroup.com forward slash events. And that web page actually provides details of some in-depth education, which I'm going to be offering as a paid course, uh, which starts around the middle of this month in two weeks' time on Saturday the 16th. Thank you, Jonathan, for putting that in the chat. Um, so we'll go through that a little bit later. But first of all, we're going to spend you know, 30, 40 minutes going through some popular stats, a bit of interactivity, a bit of fun, um, just to give a flavor of why statistics might be important to us, how we can utilize them. And I'll be interested to see how this lands and what conceptions, preconceptions we may or may not have. These kind of sessions work best when they're interactive. So feel free to raise hands, engage in the polls, which will trigger, put questions in the chat. We can even unmute you um, if we want to do that kind of thing. Um, but it's always best to have some back and forth. I don't have a gazillion charts here, but it's always nice to get other people's opinions, this kind of thing. Um, and I know within our um, groups of people who are here today, we have got a bunch of people who will be familiar with some of the concepts which we're going through. Um, it may be that I will ask a question and I'll request that the people that kind of already know the answer don't answer it. So I'm really looking to get a sense of like, you know, the, the fresh understanding or misunderstandings that are in place um but you know with all that said why don't we kick off so let's start to look at some stats first statistic we're going to think about es and the idea and i've put spx in brackets because we're only thinking about regular trading hours cash session when nyse is open so let's think about the idea of the opening gap. Now, people define gaps in different ways. Now, if we think about when cash closes at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, and when it reopens at 8.30 Central, 9.30 Eastern, it is really, 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 really unlikely that the cash market is going to open at exactly the same price that it closed at the day before. And futures, as we know, we've got the overnight Globex session from 5 p.m. Central up until 8.30 a.m. Central. Yep. So I'm looking at defining the gap, not when the open is higher than the previous day's high or lower than the previous day's low. That's not doesn't happen that frequently. But when, the, when we open at a price higher than when we closed on cash, or if we open at a price lower, than when we closed on cash, do we at some point during the trading day go back and fill that little gap between where we opened and what the previous close was? So let's actually trigger a little poll and see whether you think that there is an edge in terms of the gap between the cash open and the cash close being filled. So that should have popped up on your Zoom screens and you can... You've got a choice of two answers, yes or no. Now, I know we've got 25 people here. That's 23 if we exclude Jonathan, who is our cat herder and community manager, and myself. So hopefully we can. And I am not 20. answering the poll for you. So, Oh, look at that. <laughs> also, I can't. So, you know, there's that. 
Okay, 12 people have answered so far. Let's get another come on, five, six, eight answering. Good morning, Carsten. 15 answered. So there's an overwhelming majority. Must be a heck of an edge on this one. Say again, JVC? There must be a heck of an edge on this one. Yeah. Everyone agrees. Kind of. Okay, we've got 16 people answering. Don't know why people don't answer. Maybe they don't know. That's fair. Um, okay, we'll end the poll and we'll share it. So out of 16 people who answered, I think you've got that there now. I'm sharing it. 88%. 14 people said there is an edge in filling the gap. That's it. 88%. That's quite funny. Um, so let's actually look at the data behind this. How often does the opening gap fill? Bizarrely enough, it fills about the same amount of time as the number of people that think there's an edge in filling it. So 88% of the people we asked said there's an edge, and it fills 86% of the time. That's just bizarre, isn't it? You're the guys who are actually doing it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, <laughs> that's, that's really tickled me. So, okay. You know, what we can, let, let's think about this in simple terms. Yeah. We've got a really good clue here um, that more often than not, the market is going to go back to a known price that has been established the previous day. Yeah. I, these stats are for this calendar year. So beginning of January up until the end of August, it's about uh, 160 something days. Now, if we know that the closing price is revisited at some point during the day, it, this is the market telegraphing to us, like, this price will retrade. Like, there's a lovely clue. Why don't we just enter and take one tick? Yeah? A price is going to retrade. It probably is going to act as an inflection point. Something will happen there. It's going to hold or it will break. We might ebb and flow around it, have a little wiggle. Yeah, be an argument at that price. Do we go a bubble below yesterday's close? Yeah, there's going to be some reaction at that price, but we know it's going to trade. So rather than us looking to catch the turnaround, which a lot of people, you know, retail side of trading do, why don't we use this to our advantage and think about the market is actually telling me that 86% of the time, this price is going to retrade. If I know where I am relative to that price, then this price could serve as a really good place to get out of a trade and trade towards it. What happens when we get there? Don't know. Got to see what happens when we get there. But you know, if uh, this many days, yeah, so this is what, eight to nine days out of 10, four days a week, a given price is going to retrade. Why don't we trade towards it if we can at some point? You know, presuming a sensible entry, blah, blah, blah. We can just take the final tick. Yeah. I can get one tick on 86% of all days if I see I'm heading to that price. That's quite useful. So I think a lot of the time when people think about the price um, being revisited, they're thinking, oh, I can use that to catch a reversal. But trying to catch a reversal as it's happening is very retail. You know, I sold the high of the day and I got a gazillion points. Why not think about a price that's really likely to retrade as somewhere that's a really opportune place to exit from a trade, even if you only take one tick. Um, these are cash hours, um, Edward. I've got this on the chart. So I'm running this with NYSE cash hours. So just wanted to put that there just to twist your thinking a little bit. Um, the other thing, let's think about trend days, gap and go. Yeah, there's probably rough stats out there. People think, you know, trends days happen about 20% of the time. Well, yeah, that 14% would seem to hold true then, wouldn't it? You know, if we if we open above or below the previous close and never go back to it, that implies we're moving away from the previous close. More likely than not, it's what you would think of as a trends day with one time framing. We're only moving in one direction. Uh, but how, if we know that we're going to catch a trend day, how can we look to spot it early? Well, you know, we can do things maybe like start to dive into these statistics a little bit more. So on these minority of days where the gap isn't filled, what's the nature of the open? Where are we? Well, where was the close maybe relative to the previous day's range? 
um, where do we open? When you know, where have we opened relative to the previous day's close? So once you're aware of this subset and there is a different non-majority behavior, if you know it's advantageous to be able to exploit these days, knowing they exist, and everyone likes a trends day if they can catch it early. People hate trends days when they're trying to fade them and they get run over again and again and again. Uh, but if we can exploit it early, or if we know there's value in being able to spot one these days and catch it early, we can start to dive in a little bit deeper and see what are the characteristics of these 14 days that will maybe help us get in on the right side and enjoy the ride of a one time framing day. So I wanted to put this simple thing there as food for thought, um, really simple statistic. Um, I have seen lots of the time people get really excited going, you know, it's going there to fill the gap, fill the gap, and they'll hold out and be hugely offside um, waiting for this thing to happen. And, you know, it's a reasonable assertion because what we can see is that, the, you know, the gap does fill, you know, the open to closing gap does fill most days. But I say you don't do this at any cost. But if you do know that a given price is going to retrade, way more often than not, this is something to absolutely explore and put in your playbook. I think a playbook is really well founded if it comprises trading setups, which are made from things that occur more often than not. And then you find a way of monetizing those events that happen more often than not, rather than waiting for, if I see these two, three, 10 arbitrary indicators correlate or cross, or I see this subjective line be tested three times, or this chance pattern occur, that is very subjective with discretion. If the fact is a given price is going to trade 86% of all trading days, you start to build a plan knowing that on nearly every trading day, when you're looking at the market, if we get to proximity of that price, or you see some kind of turnaround away from that price, you've got an example of where price is going to go. So I wanted to put that out there just as a little warm up for us to get going. Um, now, I just want to check our attendees list because the next one, next statistic partly has been put together based on a question about seasonality um, that came up last week. And the person who asked that question isn't here. Hmm. Thanks for that. Anyhow, um, what we're going to look at next is the daily range. I'm, I'm using ES here, and this is the full Globex session. So 5 p.m. Central to 4 p.m. the next day Central, 23 hours of trading. And what we have got here is a bar chart showing what is the daily range by month of ES in ticks. So the average is something like 217 ticks this year. Um, is it seasonal? Well, it looks like it, doesn't it? Um, it seems that from April onwards, three months had less than average volume. One month had more, one month had about average. Um, so people like daily range, but in this kind of view, it's not that useful, really. You know, what I know is the summer will have less of a range. Okay, no surprise there. So it may go away. Yeah. But we could dive a little bit deeper. Now, people in trading research group that attend my live trading sessions know that one of the things I like to do is take a rolling 21-day daily range. So I'm looking back. I'm using a lagging average. Why am I using a lagging average? Because I can only get full month ranges at the end of the month. So this bar chart has been built at the end of each month. Yeah, If I'm sitting... Uh, the 15th of August, the actual average range is still developing. It can be skewed by any given day. So I will use a lagging rolling month knowing that it's lagging because I'm not assuming it's right. It's only an average. Yep. Uh, but what I like to do is have an idea of what the rolling month's average is. And on the current day, as the day is developing, I will add the average range to the current low of the day and I will subtract the average range from the current high of the day. So this is kind of giving me the boundaries of if this day makes the average range, where would it go to the high point? Where would it go to the low point? So I've got this sort of visual guide as to how far the market might go in either direction. 
And then I can start to look for whether that's in proximity to anything else in the market structure that's interesting. It might be previous highs, might be value areas, POCs, market profile shapes, could be anything. Yeah. Might be a chart pattern on the daily chart, might be a neckline of something. Yeah. Who knows? But it's giving me an idea that if this day is average, which of course it won't be, yeah, because the average is lagging and based on an arbitrary period, it's wrong. But it gives me a rough sense of how far might the market go on an average day. So it's giving me a clue once again of where could we go and I can start to build a plan um, based on that. So for the course statistic of what's the average range, that's the way in which I like to use it. And the rolling average to the current day's low, subtract it from the current day's high, give me an idea of what that might be. But that on its own isn't so useful. But one of the reasons I do like to understand how far a day might go is because it's really good to understand how far is far enough. Have we gone far enough yet? That's one of the phrases I use a lot um, in my education, in my live trading, in trading research group. So let's have a look at this. I mean, ooh, we've got a lot going on here. But let's have a look at this in a little bit more of a relative way to see how the data around the average range can start to become relative and we can start to utilize it maybe a bit more to our advantage. So what I've done here is for all of the days in this data set, so for each trading day, for example, in January, I've said, day one, what percentage was it of the January daily range? Did it exactly match? Is it 150%? Is it 80%? Is it 70%? So we've taken each trading day in each month, and we're logging how, what proportion of an average for that month it actually forms. I hope I'm explaining that clearly. Yeah. So we'll have a bunch of days at 100%, a bunch of days at 80%, a bunch of days at 150%. What we've then done is we've counted up in buckets of 10%, built a histogram to understand how many days are within 40 to 50% of the average for that month. How many are in a 60 to 70% bucket? How many are 90% of the average for that month? So we can now start to see the frequency and the distribution of how much of the daily range occurs. And we're now making things really relative. And it helps us to consider and answer the question, how far is too far? So we can use this in a couple of ways. Let's say I'm doing some kind of intraday swing trade. Yeah. If I'm trading somewhere from the middle of the market and I'm looking to hold this trade for as long as I possibly can, well, if I get out when the day has only made 50% of what the average range for that month has been, I may be going, I'm, I hate to say it, maybe I'm leaving money on the table. Yeah. The market has potential to go further. Now, it should be no surprise that, you know, the, the average of all of these, in the data set is around the 100% mark. That shouldn't be a surprise at all. We've got a kind of normal distribution with a longish tail. It's not that long in reality. And the midpoint of this distribution is actually around the average range. Now, the blue line is showing the cumulative total, how many days, if we keep adding this bar to this bar to this bar to this bar to this bar, how much of the data set are we getting at each percentage? So what's interesting, when we're around the midpoint, we're capturing, probably no surprise actually, about half of all trading days. So can I then stretch a trade a little bit further? The standard deviation, so it's a normal distribution, so we'd expect about 68% of all the data to fall within one standard deviation, 91, 92% fall within two standard deviations. And we can see that's about what's happening. So we're looking at the cumulative here. Well, in one standard deviation, I'm capturing 83%. So let's say I see that the daily range is in proximity to something sensible on a longer term chart. 
some pattern in market profile, the previous daily level, you know, who knows? And maybe that's at 125%, 130% the daily range. It's beyond what my projection of the average range would be. I can actually think with quite some certainty that my trade looking to get to this point has got a reasonably good chance of getting there. So I can choose to take profits quickly, yeah, because if all of these days, let's say, you know, from here onwards, do at least this amount, if I get out of a particular trade when we've only gone 40% of the day's range, I'm pretty safe, yeah? But this also allows me to really take a considered view on how far can I push a trade. The flip side to that, of course, is professionals always fade the edge. So every time we make a new extreme, new high, new high, new high, because I want to catch the high of the day, this allows us to think about, am I really catching the high of the day? Now, if you are, you know, if you do like fading the edges, then of course you, you've got to be quick. Yeah, you may well get a trade that goes a good way back into the existing range. Um, but I would contend once you have an idea of, let's call this how far is too far, you're in a much more comfortable place to assess. You know what? I've got a good chance of trading from what I would term as the outside in to the range, and it's got a good chance of going all the way back because now I think we're really done for the day. Yeah, I've got something empirical that I can use to say that was probably it for the move rather than being, oh, we broke the ledge. It's going to bounce back in, catch something. Now it's continuing, do the same, continuing to do the same. Because what we're doing there, we're, we're fighting a moving train. Yeah. Much more interesting for me, trading from the outside in, to go, I want to go from the middle to the outside for as far as possible until it's really clear that's about it. Then I'm going to change team and go from the outside back into the range. So we can take the pretty simple statistic of what's the daily range, then look for how individual days fall within that collective, how the proportion of the day's range is distributed, how the sum of these starts to shape up, and starts to use that a little bit to our advantage in order to answer the question, have we gone far enough yet? So that's the second popular statistic I wanted to look at, the daily range and different ways of interpreting it. I'm just going to pause briefly and take a quick drink of water. Meanwhile, because we've rattled through these, especially this last one, quite quickly. Um, feel free to throw any questions in the chat, and I'll talk to them now before we get on to the next um, data point that we're going to explore. JBC, if you've got any comments, feel free to ship in. I do not have any comments. That was very clear. Thank you. All right, so I had to clear my throat and I just took a quick drink of water. David, I think, can you go over the percentages and tell you which is which and labeled how, just so you're clear? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, right. So the scale on the left relates to the cumulative line. And this cumulative line is adding up each green bar. We're stacking them up and up and up. Yeah, so... No days fell into this bucket. No days fell into this bucket. 1% of days fell into this. 1% of days fell into this. So the cumulative is 2%. Well, it's not so fractional in its rounding. 2% fell in here. So we're some fraction, some fraction, plus 2 equals 3, plus 5% equals 9%. So that's the scale on the left-hand side. The right-hand side relates to the individual green bars. So this particular bucket had... 15% of all days. Yeah. And then the axis along the bottom is telling us the bucket, the, this is the count of days that did 90 to 100% of the average range. This is the count of days that did 100 to 110. So 15% did 90 to 100, 8% did 100 to 110, and so on. Does that make sense on the three labels? A little bit confusing, so they're all percentage signs. And they're all in the same color. Okay, you've got it. That's great. Good. I'm glad that's clear. It's an interesting way of looking at, you know, how can we look at the market's behavior in a really relative way 
and then start to think about how we utilize this to our advantage. So it's only a guide, you know, it's it's averages. They're going to be wrong. Why? Because they're averages. But we start to look at the distribution, we start to think about standard deviations from the mean, we start to think about how much of it it captures. We are in a position where we can assign probabilities to events. And if we've got probabilities to events, we can use this to assess and control our risk by sizing our positions accordingly. So we've done a couple of simple statistics here. We'll move on into a third one, which um, is concept known as the initial balance. So the initial balance, market profile, originated term, we're defining this as the price range that has been made during the first hour of regular trading hours. So 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Central. So that corresponds with the first hour of NYSE being open, 9.30 to 10.30 Eastern. So we're looking at the price range, the high and the low that's formed on ES or anything in this first hour period. Now, people who are current TRG members, I would like you not to participate in the next poll, please. Um, but now we have established what this price range is, the range formed within the first hour, going to put some options out there to understand how you guys look to trade, may look to trade the initial balance. So here we go. Where's my poll? Oh, um, Jonathan's launched it already. How about that? You're welcome. <laughs> so um, we've got a few answers. I'll illustrate these in my little flashing light here. Um, the options which I've put in, trading the initial balance. Do you wait for it to break and trade it in the direction of the breakout? So it's broken out up. And you know, we might wait for the retest something, but go in the direction. When we're trading around the edge, do we fade it? Do we trade from the middle to the break? Or do we do something else? At the moment, only two people have answered. So <laughs> that's not ideal. We're not gonna we're not gonna get some great stats. We're gonna look for at least 10 answers. I'm sure we've got at least 10 non-TRG members on the call. And if you don't trade the first hour, that would be something else. Absolutely. Oh, look at that. You, 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 it's like you, you shield <laughs> that. Because that used to be me. <laughs> yeah. I want to wait for the indicators to do something. Yep. Always avoid the first hour because that's when all the professionals are there. You don't want to go up yeah. against them. Stay away. So we've got eight answers. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, um, I think we probably have about as many answers as we're going to get. We've got eight people answering. I don't want trading research group people to answer because it's going to skew the results um, for this because we teach something quite specific in our setups. So you've shared those. I see JV's got you way ahead of it. So, okay, 50% of people are saying, let's go in the direction of the breakout. Okay. One person, 13% saying fade the edge, presumably this. Quarter of people are saying go from the middle towards the break, which of course presumes you know which side's going to break. Let's talk about some of these. And let's talk about fading the edge, first of all. Well, we probably should look at these statistics of this first hour's range, shouldn't we? Same period this calendar year, excluding the days that close early. Yep. Yeah? If we look at these trading days, 160 something trading days, other than 1% of days, the range breaks. So 99% of all days will look at this first hour's range and it's going to break. Now, I would contend then that if this range has formed and it hasn't broken, fading the edge of that range is a little bit dangerous. You might catch a tick, two ticks, whatever. But if we have got a range which we know is going to break 99% of the time, then fading it while it remains unbroken feels a little bit dangerous to me. Not saying you can't catch some ticks, but once again, I think you're running in front of the moving train. Yeah, you could wait for it to break and see what happens. That's fading the extreme of the session. Yeah, that's slightly different. But fading 
that range before it's broken, when it's going to break 99% of the time, for me, feels a little bit dangerous. Other interesting stats then behind this. We know 99% of all days this range is going to break. 65% of days only break one side. And then the remainder, let's call it two thirds or one third. Yeah, the remainder break both sides. So if we go back to the graphic on this, I think if we're going in the direction of the breakout, and this is classic chartist technical analysis approach, you know, I've got resistance up here, supports down here. When the resistance breaks, resistance becomes support. Let's go with it. Okay. Well, we'll come to an idea in a little bit as well. Um, but after this range has formed, if we're somewhere in the middle, aren't we missing out on actually leveraging the fact that we know on nearly every day at least one side of this range is going to break. So for the people who have said middle to edge, inside out, fantastic. This is something we teach and we advocate within Trading Research Group. Once this range has formed, much like the gap fill, the market is saying to us, we've got 99% certainty that either this price or this price is going to trade. Now, what a great place, therefore, to exit a trade if we know which way we're going. That's different to fading the edge, yeah? Let's say through, um, I don't know, my magic moon phase indicator has told me correctly that the upper edge of this range is going to break. Then if I can get a good entry here and get out here, why am I getting out here rather than leaving all this money on the table, yeah? Why am I getting out here? Because I know it's 90% likely to trade. So my job, once the range is formed, is to take a view on which sides do I think is likely to take, likely to break. Because I've got 99% certainty at least one of these sides is going to break. Which side's going to break? Like, well, I can use different bits of information, traded volume, order flow, this kind of thing to take a view. But, you know, I could even be as daft, say, I will take one tick out of the final piece of this. Yeah. There's a price here I know is going to trade. There's a price here I know is going to trade. Why don't I wait until I'm right next to it and grab a tick? So I would say shorting this before it breaks is quite dangerous. But exiting a trade that we've taken from the middle on our way there is quite smart because I know I've got high certainty of this or this trading again. So doing this as a sort of chart breakout thing and whether I you know, enter just before it breaks out or after it breaks out or wait for the reach test, all of which are optical illusions based upon whether you're looking at five minute, 15 minute, 10 range, eight, three, probe and reverse, bar type, I mean, they're all wrong. Um, it's a much more reliable trade to be thinking about, I know one of these is going to break. Can I trade towards it and get out? After that, after it happens, okay, can decide what to do. And we'll come back to that idea in a little while. Something else that gets interesting is once it's broken, I know that one side breaks 65% of all days, two sides, 34% of all days. So it's two thirds, one third. In other words, if this is broken, then only a third of all days will go back to the other side. Two thirds of all days won't go to this side. So once this is broken, it is twice as likely that the other end of the range is not going to trade versus it will trade. And this can give us some interesting things that we can do with options or event contracts. And that's something I'll be running some education on. So the fact the market has broken a range and we know the frequency at which the range is broken on one side or both sides gives us more information market generated information um, that we can utilize to build some interesting trade setups, not necessarily using futures or stocks or ETFs. We might have to use a different instrument like um, an option, an option spread or um, binary option or an event contract. But we can certainly utilize the data presented to us by the market because it's been qualified some, by some statistics. So we can combine the frequency of an event occurring together with monetary risk and look to see if the odds are in our favor at the right price in order to monetize that fact. 
something else that's interesting about the initial balance. We know it breaks. Um, in fact, before I move on to the next thing, is there anything that's unclear in what I've said there for anybody or mind blowing or it's like, oh, duh, obviously, Lee, that's how I trade all the time. That's why I'm a gazillionaire. Um, so feel free to throw anything in chat um, that springs to mind at the moment and um, I'll address that before we move on. Looks like we're good. Okay, we'll continue. So let's now think about when it breaks. We know the first hour's range is going to break. Whoops, the first hour's range is going to break pretty much every day. When does it break? So on this same data set, yeah, this year, I've lumped into 30 minute buckets. So market profile, C period, D period, E period, et cetera. I'm logging the frequency of the times when the first hour's range is broken. Look at this. 73% of the time, we break the first hour's range in the next half hour after it's formed. Sometimes you know, that happens because we're so close to it, bam, we just shoot through You know, in the next second, the next minute. Another 13% of the time, it's between 10 and 10 to 30 central. So within an hour of the first hour's range being formed, we've got what, 75, 85% likelihood that that range is going to break. Now, a lot of the times when people trade, and they get into overtrading, greed, FOMO, the monkey goes mad. The more I trade, the more I'm going to make. Uh -uh. The more you trade, the more likely you are to lose money because we don't have 100% expectancy of every of any trade working out. So we actually want to trade as little as possible and only the best possible trade setups where the odds are really demonstrably in our favor. So if we have got some setup which is defined around the first hour's range and that first hour's range breaking, what's the time window in which we should go to work? Well, we should absolutely be focusing on it between 9, 30, and 10. And if that hasn't happened, okay, we'll give it 10 to 10, 30. After that, why bother? Yeah? Or if you've got the trade wrong, walk away. We're not going to get incrementally more opportunities through the rest of the trading day. So if you've got you know, any addiction issues on trading, greed, need, whatever else it is, understanding what the market does and when it does it is a really powerful way of caging the monkey um, that results in bad behaviors and overtrades you blowing up accounts. So we can look at events based around time-based ranges and start to understand when do these events occur and use that again to our advantage or use it to control some behavior. Um, one of the setups that I'll be going through is what could we do with zero data expiry options and option spreads and collecting premium based around the break of the initial balance. And if we're collecting premium, what we want is as much time value as possible that erodes throughout the trading day. It's pointless me doing anything on a credit spread with an hour to go. But if I know I've got five, six, seven hours to go and I've got more time value, then if I'm the seller of an option, then the earlier the better. So we can use this kind of information to define trade setups and understand when do I go to work? What's the job I've got to do? So there's some interesting stuff we can absolutely do um, with the initial balance. And I, I put the various, you know, go in the direction of the breakout, fade at the edge, middle to edge, inside out, out there as some ideas, because there's lots of things we can start to do around time-based ranges. And it's not just the initial balance. We can look at the overnight range. We can look at any 30-minute periods. You know, 30 is arbitrary, it's market profile. We can look at the first 30 minutes or the second 30 minutes compared to the first. Or what happens during lunchtime? Yeah, maybe your day job means that you can't trade um, during the first hour. Maybe you can only trade when you get home. Yeah, but we could start to see, well, after two hours at lunchtime, what happens in the final hour up to the close? Once you get into this way of thinking about the fact that the market is bounded by time, and this is why whatever chart period you're looking at is wrong. As soon as you divide up anywhere on futures between 5 p.m. and 4 p.m. the next day into something arbitrary, five-minute slices, 10-range slices, 
you, you're just giving yourself an optical illusion. The only truth is that Globex, the futures, opens at 5 p.m. Central. Cash opens at 8.30 Central, 9.30 Eastern. Cash closes at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, and then the futures close an hour later. There's the boundary of the market, yeah? Futures traders will probably go to lunch somewhere between 12 and 2. Is there something we can do about that? So once you start to look at behaviors of different time-based ranges, and if you can find some overwhelming statistic, like, well, this range breaks 99% of the time. In other words, the market is telling me one of the at least one of these two prices is going to retrade pretty much every day. You can start to build some trade setups around it. So this is a nice way and relatively simple of looking at what's going on. Now, we've looked at filling the gap, price that's highly likely to retrade. We've looked at how far is too far, so average range, and how often do we do 100% of the range, 150% of the range, 50% of the range, or in other words, how likely is it we're going to go X far? And we've looked at the initial balance, first hour's range. What if we start to put some of these things together? Could we have a light bulb moment? Well, let's think about this. The initial balance, the first hour's range, breaks one side only twice as often as it breaks both sides. 65% of all days only break one side, 34% of all days break both sides. So if we break the initial balance to the upside, first hour's range, yeah, we know that we are twice as likely to not trade the other side of that range as we are. What we could do, once we have got this clue from the market, that the initial balance has broken, let's say, the high, yeah? Okay. I now know that we are more unlikely, or rather less likely, to trade near the low. Okay? Good news. So once we have broken the upside, we're somewhere here, and this is the people trading the breakout, yeah? People loving the chart. We could do something like consider what's the daily range. If from the low of the day, including overnight, wherever it is down here, maybe by adding the average range of a day to the session low, full session low, maybe the average range is somewhere up here. Well, we've broken the initial balance high. I know I'm twice as likely to not trade back down here. I could consider how far is the market likely to go on an average day and think, well, I've already got a clue, simplistic clue on direction. I know I haven't gone that far compared to an average day. Here's my clue on what the market might do. So we can start to take some actually totally unrelated statistics. How far does the market tend to go on a typical day? Does a time-based range give us any clues to the behavior later on? And start to assemble this into a really good story of what the market is likely to do for the rest of the day. Now, how you trade that doesn't matter. Yeah, You might choose to only scalp in that direction. You might choose to wait until the market has gone all the way up. It's gone to somewhere around the average range, and you're looking to fade it back into the middle if you're really patient. You might choose to look for a really favorable opportunity to, to re-enter on a pullback long and start to head up. Maybe it's a day trade, so you get a good entry, you hold it, you maybe scale in, scale out of it. But we can take really simple behaviors and statistics and use those to our advantage in building trade setups. And that's looking at two really, really simple things. Yeah, average range for a given day, first hour's range and how it breaks. So all we're doing there is looking at price, and we're looking at price over a range of time. But there's so much more information that we can start to look at. If we start to look at other representations of the market, we can look at things like market profile. So what's market profile? It's a 30-minute chart that's been crunched onto itself. So we have got an idea of how many 30-minute periods did the market trade at a given price. And market profile you know, came about as a concept before real-time volume was there. It's using time. It's using time at price 
as a proxy for volume at price, which is what we're seeing here on the rice and these footprints. But even in market profile, we have got things like edges, we've got low volume areas, we've got tails, we can have runs of single prints in the middle. This is giving us another framework of data that we can look to collect and start to analyze how often does a particular pattern remain in place in a market profile representation of a trading day versus how often is it not there? And that means if we see something during a trading day, but it tends not to be there at the end of a trading day, the market's given us another clue that here is a price level that's likely to retrade in order for this pattern to disappear. So I very much like the idea of if the market can flag to us, here's a price that's going to retrade, we can use that to our advantage. We might use that price to enter for various reasons, or we might use it as a known, highly likely exit point for another trade. And then our job is to say, if I'm going to get to here, how do I look to get to that point? A lot of people, certainly a lot of retail technical analysis traders, will see a particular pattern occur. Magic indicator goes green, chart pattern occurs, and I go, oh, this has happened. I've got to get in. But they don't think about where they're going to get out. They use an arbitrary take profit stop loss. Yeah, the market doesn't care about that. That's why these traders tend to lose. Now, the analogy I like to make is if I go to the train station, I don't jump on the first train that turns up. Yeah, I've got a plan of where I'm going to go. If I want to get to London, I live in the UK. Um, if I turn up at my station, I'm not looking at any notice boards, and I just jump on the first train that turns up. I might end up in Manchester when my plan was to go to London. That isn't really a good result. So it's much better to have an idea of where you're looking to go and then look at what's the best way of me getting to this place, price, that is going to trade with a certain likelihood, how can I get there in the most favorable way? So I like understanding where the market is likely to go and building up trade setups that allow me to exploit the fact that this price is really likely to trade again. So market profile can give us various clues. If you look at volume at price in footprint charts or volume profiles, then there is so much data here. If we're starting to see how much volume is traded aggressively, how many contracts lift the offer, how many contracts hit the bid at every price. We can distill so much information. We can see conditions like unfinished business, unfinished auctions. We can see sweeps in the order book. Yeah, We can see absorption when a lot of volume, there's some up here just hidden away, when a lot of volume is trading aggressively, but we can't get beyond that level. So when we start to put volume at price into this mix as well, we can start to have a huge number of data points we can analyze, but they will all give us really good, powerful information about this price is likely to trade again. And we can combine that with where we are trading now, and that gives us our opportunity. I'm loath to say reward, but I will. And we can also understand which prices are unlikely to trade. So we can now start to assemble trade setups based on the balance of probabilities of price X trading versus the probability of price Y not trading. And then if we have got some favorable mix of the prob probabilities and our entry price is right versus the risk that we want to take, this is how we can assemble trade setups that have positive expectancy. We've got an edge. We've stacked the deck in our favor. And that's the concept we were getting into in last week's session. So this starts to get really powerful. What we're doing is we're removing all of the elements of discretion or subjectivity from our trading decisions. And the beauty of this is if you if you ever had the experience of, you know, I, I, I have a good feeling about this trade and it goes against you, but I've still got a good feeling and good feeling, good feeling. And suddenly you're $4,000 underwater because you can't be wrong and you're blinded to what's going on. Trading in this kind of approach and in this sort of framework can keep you away from these very discretionary decisions based upon sense or feel. What we're doing is we're making everything totally objective, totally based on data, so we can qualify. I know the likelihood of us retrading at this price. 
I know the likelihood of us not trading at this price. Now what I have to do is balance the risk of where I am versus the payback of where I am to where I'm going to, and I can assess whether or not this is a positive cash flow trade. Now, what you will find is this reduces the number of trades you take, um, which for some people is bad, but I'm missing out on all these opportunities. Yeah, I would say you are missing out on all these opportunities, big, bold type, to lose money when your discretionary analysis goes wrong. And it's not to say you might take a statistic, you might take a statistically unfavorable trade and be able to manage it and make some money. Yeah. But that was either through luck or good fortune or sense or something else. And sooner or later, that is going to bite you and it's going to bite you really badly. It's because you're doing a concept known as resulting. You're being rewarded for making bad decisions. And the more that you get a reward for making a bad decision, the more you make that bad decision until one day you get totally run over and boom, you've blown up an account with $5,000 in it, whatever. So this kind of framework can really keep you on side of only trading when the odds are in your favor. And hopefully this is a bit intriguing. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that this kind of trading approach is something we're going to be running some education on uh, later in this month. It gives you a smorgasbord, a buffet, a huge selection of ways in which you can trade. Once you've got the mindset of, I want to look for events that occur, and I want to understand the likelihood of something occurring and the likelihood of something not occurring. And of course, we, you know, we need these things to happen enough that we've got enough opportunities during a trading day or trading month. It can totally change the way you look at the market. You're no longer looking at chart patterns, and, ugh, fibs or wiggly waggly line technical indicators. You are mining data. Yeah. And what we'll be running some education on is how can we gather statistics utilizing the data that's in our trading platforms? How can we monetize these statistics? So the nature of some trading setups, what instruments we can use to actually trade this type of setup. This is crucial. How can we win, win more than we can lose? So at what price are we interested in taking this trade? Just because we see that we've got 85% probability of reaching this price and only 15, let's not say 15, let's say 4% probability of reaching another price, doesn't mean we enter the trade right now. Yeah, we need to assess when the odds are really in our favor based upon where the market is right now. And that's combining events and getting our position size right. So we'll be going through a lot of the theory. It's not complicated, but we're looking at the data collection, then what can we use this data for to build trade setups? And then how can we assemble these data elements into setups and systems that have got a statistical edge. We'll then, using Sierra Chart, look at how we can use some features in Sierra Chart and possibly some add ons for Sierra Chart to either give us a kind of go or no go uh, marker, flag, indicator, I hate to say it, that our setup's in place and it's favorable. But then if we're getting a go, no go, because we can't trust the human, we can even look to automate this kind of system. And once you're able to have a little system running like this, your time is now freed up not to be staring at the chart, but you can do more research and you can develop your playbook. So if this is intriguing for you, you can read more about this upcoming training here, tradingresearchgroup.com forward slash events. I'm going to bring up that web page now, which is here. And if you visit this page, this is what you'll see. Um, we've got a little bit of blurb um, about what this is about. There is a recording of last week's session where we get into some of the emotive stuff, is trading gambling or not. Um, we'll put a recording of today's session here as well. And we have the class schedule. So this, will, this class will start, this course will start, in a couple of weeks' time, on 16th September. It's going to be around this time every week for one to two hours, most lectures, and um, we will run over 10 weeks. The course is split into two parts. The first part is foundational and initial setups. This is very much based initially on getting in the skills on how to gather statistics around market structure and how to monetize them. We'll be looking at ranges. And we will look as well at how we can win more than we lose. 
initially, the right way to trade these things are actually using things like options and binary options. So you might be trading futures or equities at the moment and go, oh, I'm not interested in that. You know, that's fine. But you need these foundational skills of the simple binary outcomes. This happens or it doesn't happen in order to combine multiple binary outcomes together. Yeah, you've, you've got to be able to understand the likelihood of one thing happening before you can balance the likelihood of one thing happening versus another thing happening. That's the first part of the class, of course. In the second part of the course, we think, okay, how can we move beyond simple binary outcome products and exploit this idea of statistics in more asset classes, stocks, ETFs, futures? And we'll then get it in some of the statistics around volume at price, order flow, market profile, what we can identify and how we can gather this stuff and look at how we can combine multiple data points in order to size a position. Then we start to get into some really fun stuff and we say, okay, if we have got a system that has got a positive edge and we're going to have worked examples in this course of trading systems that do have positive edge, and you're going to understand from first principles and be able to build them yourself, we'll go through all this, then how can we look at doing a kind of go, no go, or even automating it using features within Sierra chart and possibly some add-ons, we'll see. Then we'll see, okay, you've already got one trading system in your pocket that's got positive expectancy in our card counter playing blackjack. What else could you do? What kind of things can you start to research for yourself using these skills, which you've gained through the course? And how far could you take this? Even how could you apply this to things like trading evaluators, top step, apex, people like that. And of course, at the end of each um, course portion, we're going to have a lot of interaction, tutor group Q&A, office hours, uh, bring you questions. So this is very much skills transfer and understanding things from first principles. Um, so this comprises 10 live classes, typically one to two hours. There's going to be recorded, everything's recorded. Today's recorded. Um, you have online access forever, either you know, for as long as Vimeo exists or you exist to the class recordings. We have an online community. We will have a dedicated stream um, for students. You can interact with me, the instructor, other students, and as well as our online order for education. You'll get that as soon as you sign up. Now, this class is priced at $12.99 for the 10-week course. But if you book before the day after Labor Day, we're doing a little introductory offer where there's a saving. People in trading research group, they already know of their member benefits around this. Or it might be you're not sure, or you need a bit of time, you want to check if this is fuel. Maybe you just trade options. Yeah. If you so wish, you can book onto part one only. And then at some point before part two, you can book into part two. Yeah. So there's a bundle price if you take everything now together with an introductory discount. Or you might want to dip your toe in the water and see what it's like. So we've got various options there. A whole bunch of FAQs on here as well. Um, you can look at some of my previous educational um, classes. So that will take you to YouTube and the fun live session we had where I was teaching something theoretical. And actually, the example played out in the live market, so we traded it. And if this doesn't answer your questions, you can just reach out to us. And I'm also happy to schedule a call, and we can talk through any of this. Now, I know that within the people we have here, a bunch of our students and guests have actually already booked on. We've still got a couple of weeks. I will do another live preview next week. Subject matter, I'm not sure yet. I'm going to see how this lands, see what follow-up questions we've got. But we'll certainly look at a high level at some of the other concepts we've got in here and do another session next weekend as a preview. It might even be office hours. Maybe you're intrigued by this and you just want to come with your questions. We might do that as sort of tutor round table ahead of this class. So that's what we have coming. If this is of interest to you, please visit this page. Um, yeah, there's an introductory offer, as I said, before Tuesday. If you book, you can save some money. Um, but this is a really, I find, fun, low stress for sure way in which to trade. And it can help you out a lot. Now, Jonathan, I know you potentially have another call you need to join. But you've been taking this approach for the past month or two, haven't you? And it's uh, made some changes in your mindset around your trading. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, just knowing 
knowing what to what to wait for um because patience is has always been a struggle for me um you know i i, I do get very eager i want to get in there and i want to trade etc and uh knowing that i can have a measurable demonstrable edge by waiting for one side of a range to break you know like mm-hmm. the overnight like the first hour etc and then take my view and, you know, read the order flow, qualify the ledge, decide, okay, are we done yet? Have we gone far enough? Where might we get to? Um, that's been another, and, and this is, this is something I've been employing for a lot longer, of course, just because of TRG, but just the whole idea of have we gone far enough and where might we go with some statistical, mm-hmm. f- some statistical frequency um, that is known that is not just, Oh, I think we could get here. I feel like we could get there. You know, we got here once before we can do it again. You know, why based on what, um, you know, that, that has been a huge changer in my, my, you know, overall trading for the, whatever it's been now, almost four years, I guess uh, that I've been in TRG is, is that was a huge mindset change. It's just knowing that, yes, you can actually see where might we get to with a statistical probability and have we gone far enough towards that yet? And if we haven't, then you can, you can come up with a very realistic plan and get a good entry, et cetera. So. And, and what we'll be adding into those ideas is for the amounts of drawdown I have available, how much I want to put at risk, what is the right size with which to trade? Because that's what kills yes. people most of the time. It's, mm-hmm. it's either psychological issues, you know, not being wrong, not knowing when you're wrong, and or trading in this way with too much size. Mm-hmm. So being able to leverage the data uh, that the market tells us, yeah, um, to be able to size positions accordingly, whether your objective is I don't want to risk more than X or I'm trying to achieve a return of Y is really helpful. Um, yeah, I- we'll be getting into that a lot. Yeah, that that's been particularly helpful for me because I I, I mean we've talked about this in TRG. A few of us have this, but I struggle with the issue of being too comfortable with risk. It just doesn't yeah. it doesn't freak me out, and it should. That's not necessarily a good thing. Um, and so I'm I'm way too comfortable with sizing up and then just getting you know holding to my conviction, saying no no I just need to be patient. I just need to hold. I just need to hold. I just need to hold. Ah crap. You know, and, and, and that has happened way too many times. And so now being able to, to size according to a positive expectancy setup that assures that, you know, over time, of course, any one trade, anything can happen, but that over time, and I do plan to be doing this for a really long time, um, over the long run, I will never get killed doing it this way because I'm always sized appropriately to what the data shows I can sustain. And and that has really helped to keep me from sizing too much and sticking to my arbitrarily decided convictions of we're not going to get here or we're definitely going to get there. Um, they were just, you know, plucked out of my, you know, pick an orifice. Um, you know, th- this is this is a lot better. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And and I've, I've seen that change um, within your trading as well, which is great. So we've pretty much covered, you know, the meat of this session. Um, we will look to do another preview next week. Uh, but right now, you know, I'm very happy to answer any questions um, from anybody. Feel free to, you know, raise your hand. We can unmute you or throw them into the chat. So I'll allow a minute or two for people to compose their question, put it in the chat. Um, and while we're doing that, we'll be entertained by Jonathan's MyMax. It's really good. Yeah. Look at me go. Okay, question from wow, Baron. Wow, people type fast. <laughs> you guys have been sitting um, on those with your finger on the button, haven't you? <laughs> okay, I'm going to read David's first. It feels more like a statement than a question. Let's have a look. David is uh, saying slash asking, what this will hopefully help teach me, at least I'm looking forward to, is thinking like a problem. Pro- I know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> Probabilistic. <laughs> like oriented trader, as this is a much needed skill to sit on hands and looking for the best setups, trigger finger. Yeah. Look, trading's the best video game ever, isn't it? The problem is yep. it, it doesn't take quarters. You can blow up dollar <laughs> accounts. Yeah, it takes $1,000 yeah. bills. <laughs> Quickly. Really quickly, 30 yep. minutes. Oops. Um, so is it, even if you know, you're wanting to you know, scalp in a high-frequency manual way, 
at least you can trade in the framework of knowing what the market is likely to do and what it's doing at this time. So it helps you find you know, what we'd call in trading research groups, ace-king setups. So absolutely. It, it can be frustrating for people at first because it's stopping you from doing stuff. But that has to be a good thing. Yeah, we're saving you from the addictive monkey brain that's wanting to burn your account. The last uh, two days, David, were, were a perfect example of this for me is I sat on my hands both days, didn't trade because my edge was not there. And, you know, and I knew this without any doubt. There was no question. I wasn't getting FOMO because, well, but it might work. It might. It, 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 the edge was not there. And I could yeah. measure it and see it. And that, that's all there was to it. So I did nothing. Yeah. Uh, Bauer is... Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Bauer is saying on the ATR statistics slide, there's a number of 36%, one standard deviation of the mean, where it lands on the other side of the mean. What's the percentage range within one standard deviation yeah okay let's go back to that and have a look at it now um dink 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 so it's this chart so to the other side the mean is 97 percent. so 97 minus 36 is going to be what 40 no what am i 60 so within one standard deviation, let's get the spotlight. We're capturing from this area ish 130% of daily range down to it's going to be what 60% of daily range. So you can be thinking, and I, I think I know the way you're thinking here, Bao, is that if you were to look to exit on a given trade when we're at about 60 percent of the trade what are we actually not so much missing out on what's the likelihood of us not even getting to that and it's everything underneath here so i i think i'm expressing that in the right way. i'm not certain Feel free to expand better on what you're saying. I tend to look at it from this way. I'm always thinking about how far can we go. I want to know, you know, what, how likely are we to have gone too far? But maybe you're looking at this from a different perspective or a different objective. So feel free to put that in the chat. Because remember, as well, it's cumulative. Yeah. So for me, What's interesting is the accumulation of these days because the range builds. So I'm interested in how many of all days get to here or here, get to at least here or at least here or at least here. So it's kind of the inverse of what this accumulation is. If I'm looking for how many days get to at least here, how, yeah, how many of all days get to at least 70%? Yeah, it is everything up to here and beyond. It's it's the right edge from the mean, which is what is less likely to happen. I'm talking around this in, in quite clumsy ways. I'm not certain because I'm I'm sort of interpreting a question, wanting to know the projection on the left hand side. Gives you realistic conservative targets. Okay, that's great. Um, and yeah, you know, the recording of this is going to be up as well, but you. You've got the gist, I think, of you know the point behind this. But you can apply this, of course, in many different ways. So a um, couple of well, good observations and good question there from Bauer. Um, trigger fingers and medical condition. Yeah, it's dopamine, isn't it? It's looking for thrills. Um, so if there are any other questions, please throw them in the chat now. Um, the link for this page is up there in the browser window. We'll just whack it in the chat one more time tradingresearchgroup.com forward slash events that's where you can go to find out more we'll look to do one more session next week ahead of the course starting and as i say feel free to reach out directly if you've got any questions that aren't answered here and um, hope to see some or all of you at next week's preview and hopefully on the class um this is very much a topic that i enjoy i like to utilize this in my trading and hopefully that's been conveyed to you guys and I can help you 
um, get some value out of it as well. So thanks so much for your time and your attention today, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. And TRG members, uh, we will see you at our next live event, which given it's Labor Day holiday. Ides of Tuesday. Ides of Tuesday, start of week kickoff. So we will catch you all then. So thanks, everyone. Enjoy your holiday weekend if you are in the US. Bye for now.